If you were trying to run a modern state, one of the things that you did to show just how up-to-date you were was got hold of gunpowder weapons. The curious thing about the medieval handgun is that they fired not only the expected lead ball, but they also fired arrows. If by mistake, in the heat of battle, the wrong lot was fired in the wrong succession, the chances were that the gun would blow up in the user's face. The Royal Armouries displays its collections in its historic home, the Tower of London, in Fort Nelson near Portsmouth on the south coast, and in a specially built museum in Leeds in the north of England. Across these three sites, the museum displays one of the greatest collections of arms and armour in the world. Today, we're used to firearms being reliable, accurate, fast shooting weapons. Because of this, it's perhaps difficult for us to understand why they took so long to make an impact on the battlefield. It took some 700 years from the first use of gunpowder in China, and some 200 years from the first use of the gun in Europe to produce a battle-winning weapon. Why did it take so long? And what was it that at the end of the Middle Ages made firearms so much more effective that they changed the face of battle and the course of world history forever? It was over a thousand years ago that the Chinese mixed together saltpeter, sulfur and charcoal and created gunpowder. When the mixture was lit, it produced the world's first firework. From firework to manscarer to gun were gradual, inevitable steps that then took place in China. But it was not until the early 14th century that Europeans began to harness the power of gunpowder and make guns. A frightening new noise was beginning to be heard on the medieval battlefield, the roar of gunfire. By the 16th century, the gun unquestionably dominated the battlefield. But before the invention of the gun, warfare looked like this. Medieval battles were fought at close quarters. Illustrations show battlefields packed with foot soldiers and armoured knights fighting with the conventional weapons of the time, the sword, axe, crossbow and spear. The fighting was vicious and bloody. This was battle before the gun. The date of the gun's introduction to the battlefield is uncertain, but it had appeared by 1326. In that year, guns were being made in Florence, Italy, and illustrations of guns appear in books written for the education of the young King Edward III of England. So it's likely that handguns first went to war early in the 14th century. Examples of these early handguns are quite rare, and the few that exist in collections are difficult to date including this early example in the Royal Armouries collection. This is the earliest example we have of what we would regard now as a handgun, the medieval use of the term, rather than the modern one, which usually means a pistol. But a handgun in the Middle Ages was simply a gun that was light enough and small enough to be carried around and fired by hand. This is a very straightforward example of a type that appeared quite commonly in the 15th century, uh, but it has the, the basic components of the medieval handgun of any time, a simple muzzle-loading barrel, the ball or projectile loaded at the muzzle after the powder charge, touched off at the breech using usually a piece of burning match cord. This example has a long tail which served to steady the gun while it was being fired and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes but it's simply a device for steering it. But the whole gun is made of one large wrought iron forging. The early handgun was certainly a danger to the enemy but could also be a danger to the gunner himself. They were difficult to use, sometimes unreliable. In some sieges and some battles, badly made handguns and defective powder combined to make the weapons unworkable, even dangerous. The risk of the gun blowing up or of the gunner getting burnt were constant hazards for those early medieval handgunners. And this may explain why other soldiers so mistrusted guns. <laughs> 
The new weapon was a danger to handle. There was a real risk of the gunner blowing himself up if the burning match cord he held in his hand came into contact with the considerable quantities of gunpowder he carried on him. For a while at least, tried and tested weapons, the bow and the crossbow, seemed better to use en masse in battle and to be at least as effective as these first guns. So to begin with, the gunner's effect was limited. There was another problem though with, with the handguns of this period. One cannot aim the gun accurately at anything. One can't look down the gun barrel at all. And this was one of the great disadvantages with the handguns of perhaps the 14th and 15th centuries, that it was impossible to do three things at once. You had firstly to aim the gun in the direction you wanted to shoot at. You had to look at what you were shooting at and also try and touch off the powder. So you had to try and look in three places at once. The weight of the gun, its awkwardness, the possibility of its explosion were hazards that any gunner would have been used to. But it was a, it was a cumbersome and relatively inaccurate business. And if the medieval handgun was inaccurate and dangerous, it was also competing with other very effective weapons. Compared to archery, which was at its height in medieval Europe, particularly in England in the 14th and 15th centuries, powerful archers could shoot accurately up to perhaps 400 yards and could aim at a specific target with a very good chance of hitting it. The handgunner, unfortunately, had practically no chance of really hitting the individual he was aiming at. And that remained true even up to the 19th century with simple, smooth-bore, muzzle-loading guns. They were inherently inaccurate. It was archers and crossbowmen who still dominated the battlefield. And archers in England held gunners in very low esteem. Would to God that this unhappy weapon had never been invented and that so many brave and valiant men had not died by the hands of those who are often cowards and shirkers, who would never look in the face of those whom they lay low with their wretched bullets. The gun is a tool invented by the devil to make it easier to kill each other. There was some truth in this argument, but English archers, trained from childhood in the art of shooting the longbow, themselves proved to be very efficient killers of men. The archer's skill had been proven on the battlefields of Europe, where their speed and accuracy had been decisive. Cressy, Poitiers, Agincourt were all great victories against the French in the Hundred Years' War. Longbows could send up clouds of arrows that fell onto the enemy from a distance or shoot directly at him as he advanced, easily loosing over ten arrows a minute, a rate the handgun could not compete with. But on most of the battlefields of Europe, the most powerful weapon was the crossbow, which didn't need the years of training of the English archer to operate. The crossbow was used extensively in Europe. Its potential as a lethal weapon had caused one 12th century pope to demand its banning from the battlefield as being unfair. The ban failed. Spanning a crossbow needs mechanical assistance. The bow is usually too strong to be drawn by hand, which makes its rate of loading and shooting comparable to the handgun. In this test, both weapons produce roughly the same rate of fire. This crossbow uses a windlass, a series of rope pulleys cranked by a handle to draw back the bowstring. The crossbow, like the handgun, was slow to load, but it was reliable and powerful and used in large numbers on the battlefields of Europe, it proved a formidable weapon for centuries. So why did the gun take over? One answer to the curious question of why an earth bother with something that's so cumbersome and, and relatively slow and inaccurate is that it was relatively simple to train a large number of people to shoot them. And if what you're trying to do is shoot projectiles of some kind into, say, a fortification during a siege, somebody could be trained, I think, in a very short time to place powder and ball or other projectile down the muzzle, ram it home, prime the vent and fire the gun in the general direction of the enemy without too much difficulty. They were not so cheap to manufacture, but they were relatively simple to operate. The handgun was still waiting for acceptance. Although the technology was almost working, 
social and military factors were to hold back its progress and its potential contribution to warfare. Rare early 15th century illustrations like these show us what medieval handguns looked like. A simple tube with a handle or tiller. But how well they worked, or even how they were made, has remained something of a mystery. There are only a handful of craftsmen who have medieval blacksmithing skills. One, Hector Cole, was commissioned by the Royal Armouries to try and make a working replica handgun. There is little contemporary research and fewer rules. The making of the tube is fairly straightforward. It's a general blacksmithing skill that they would have had at that time. The actual forging of the tube into a gun barrel that will be safe to fire and will look like a gun barrel um, with, with the tiller, which is the piece you hold when you're firing the gun so that you can aim it and keep as far away as possible when it goes bang. Um, that side of it then, yes, we are experimenting here today. We are not sure 100% on how they would have done it. The success of the process turns on shaping the barrel from one thick sheet of metal. This is extremely difficult to get right. The problem of making a 15th century handgun is, is the technique that they use for making the actual barrel and keeping the bore of the barrel at a, a, a regular size. The problems take time to overcome. This unique attempt to discover the secrets of the medieval gunsmith's skills wasn't easy. Several days of experimentation followed to work out how much heat and hammering were needed to make a barrel strong enough to be fired. The next problem was to make the smooth bore barrel a regular shape capable of firing lead shot. We've got uh, manuscripts which explain the uh, barrel maker's art and the mandrel that the actual barrel is formed around. I've adapted the one that I was going to use to one that conforms to the description in the manuscript and we'll see if it works. The next stage is the difficult one. It needs very careful attention. Now it's important that uh, when you're forming it around this mandrel, and especially at the critical stage when you're welding up the seam of the gun, that you don't get the mandrel stuck in the barrel, because if, if you do that then you've got a lot of difficulties, you have a job to get it out. The length of the barrel and the diameter of the bore are a matter of personal choice. The smiths who made these early guns would have been excellent craftsmen, but they weren't necessarily specialist gun makers. There were very few standards for gun making in the 15th century. Medieval guns reflected the individual expertise of the smiths who made them. The gun barrel is hammered into a six-sided shape. The handgun is tested on a military firing range. No one is sure how the gun will perform but it's been constructed with great skill using authentic methods. The gun performs well. Loaded with 50 grains of powder, it puts a big dent into metal plate a sixteenth of an inch thick, equivalent to an average medieval breastplate, but it doesn't penetrate it. Velocity tests measuring the speed of lead shot in the air show that the handgun with a bore of about one centimetre was propelling lead at a lethal speed of 802 miles per hour, four times faster than a longbow arrow. The lead ball from the handgun is flattened on the steel plate. The curious thing about the, the medieval handgun is that we know from the original records that they fired not only the expected lead ball, which everybody is familiar with, the musket ball of centuries later, but they also fired arrows, which is something that's only recently really been looked at in, in any detail. Certainly the earliest illustration in England of a cannon shows it firing an arrow, which has been a bit of a mystery. Why on earth an arrow? But in fact, some uh, other, much smaller gun arrows have survived in a castle in Germany. This is a, a modern reconstruction. It's very similar to a crossbow bolt, but its fletchings are made of brass, which means that they don't get burned away when the gun is fired. But the interesting thing too about this whole concept of technology, firing an arrow rather than a ball from a smoothbore barrel, is still with us. Mod modern tank gun artillery is a smoothbore barrel firing a heavy steel arrow.
which is designed to do as this arrow did in the Middle Ages, to punch a hole through armour. Medieval gun arrows, made of oak with steel tips and three brass fletchings, were supported in the barrel by leather washers, which fell away when the gun was fired. The modern armour-piercing arrow has fins to stabilise its flight through the air. It's encased in a disposable sabot, a sleeve which guides the missile down the barrel. When it reaches the muzzle of the gun, the three parts of the sabot fly off, leaving the arrow to attack its target. It punches through the toughest tank armour in a series of burrowing movements. As the tip collapses on impact, the energy pushes the arrow deep into the tank's metal plating around the turret, the tank's sensitive control area. The arrow carries no explosives. Its penetrative power knocks out engines, guns and personnel cheaply and effectively. The impact also causes the explosions. This modern fin-stabilised projectile is the 21st century equivalent of the arrow shot by a 15th century hand gunner to disable an armoured knight. If you wanted to be running a modern state, one of the things you needed was an army that used gunpowder weapons. Some reports of early hand gunners and their weapons weren't flattering. In 1453, one tells of cowardly gunners surrounding their victim, shooting him through the thigh, killing his horse and then killing him as he fell to the ground. Nobody really knew quite what to do with it. And it was smelly, noisy and certainly not a gentleman's weapon. A century later though, the arquebus, an early form of musket, was more effective. Improvements in its basic design and a better ignition system suddenly gave the gun a much needed technological shove in the back. It was much easier to train somebody to use it. It took weeks perhaps as opposed to the years to produce a trained longbowman. Its explosion frightened men and even more importantly horses. The 16th century battle scene depicted here shows mounted knights with swords protected by fine plate armour attacking highly trained mercenary pikemen who would fight for either side if the money was right and if it wasn't they would change sides or simply go home. But when fighting they were the best in Europe. Between the pikes are hand gunners shooting at point blank range. and it could produce a pretty ferocious effect on the battlefield. At Pavia in 1525, Francis I of France took on an imperialist force of mixed arquebusier and pikemen. He attacked them with cavalry, but couldn't actually get at the arquebusier, who were in a strong position, protected by the pikes. Firing rapidly, they cut the French cavalry down in huge numbers, and about 8,000 were killed. So primitive, though these weapons were, they could certainly have a pretty dreadful effect on the battlefield. At the Battle of Pavia, the cream of the French cavalry was slaughtered by the arquebus or musket operated by lowly foot soldiers. It was a significant victory. It was one of the first times in a major European battle that firearms had been used in numbers to secure a conclusive victory in just over an hour. During the battle, the pikes protected the gunners as they reloaded and fired with devastating effect on the French cavalry which charged them again and again, bravely but foolishly. There were 3,000 arquebusiers working closely with pikemen, moving quickly together around the battlefield in a partnership that combined the old dependable spear technology with the new technology of gunpowder. The deadly volleys of fire that crashed over the battlefields of Italy in the early 16th century announced that the gun had come of age. The ugly and awkward duckling of late medieval warfare had become a murderous Renaissance swan. Apparently quite suddenly, the cumbersome hand cannon had gone, and there had appeared something which we can recognise as a proper gun, with lock, stock and barrel. A gun powerful enough to kill a man in full armour accurate enough to take a heavy toll on the battlefield, and fast enough to match and rapidly replace the crossbow. But this was by no means the end of the story. 
Instead, the gun's sudden success unleashed an explosion of effort to make it even better, more reliable, more accurate, and faster shooting. In Europe, the age of the gun had arrived with a bang. This 16th century musket has all the familiar features of a modern rifle, the lock, stock, and barrel, and some of the advantages. Compared to the handgun of the later Middle Ages, this was a major technological advance. This gun actually dates from the reign of Henry VIII, and we know precisely that he bought 4,000 of exactly this kind of weapon in 1544 to arm his army. The simple iron tube, which we recognize from the medieval handgun, has been mounted into a simple wooden stock. The advantage of that was that for the first time you could actually aim the gun effectively. Now demonstrate that you can actually put the gun stock to your shoulder and for the first time look down the barrel. You have a good chance then of aiming much more precisely the ball as it goes towards the enemy. The best way to find out how good these guns really were was to build a working replica based on an original Henry VIII musket. Gunsmith Peter Dyson was commissioned to build the matchlock gun. The original gun is 450 years old and though technically advanced for its time, little is known about how it performed in action. Well, this gun is a copy of one which probably came from Henry VIII's bodyguard. It's certainly exactly like the ones that they uh, discovered on the Mary Rose, and it's probably the very first example of a military musket that was made. One of only three surviving examples in the world is used as a reference. The lock on the original is carefully studied and copied. The innovative lock mechanism is made using, where possible, the techniques of a 16th century gunsmith. I think the lock itself is brilliant. I think it's a good design, well ahead of its years, really. And it must have been a real aid uh, when you were shooting this musket to have a lock which you could cock and leaf cocked and then carefully take aim and then fire. It was quite significant. 16th century gunsmiths used the same technique to fit the lock precisely into the stock. Black soot from a candle flame stains the back of the lock. The soot deposits stain the wood, showing where it still needs to be cut back. The lock and stock slowly take shape. Many replica guns are made to be displayed. This one will be fired on a military range with increasing charges of gunpowder. There is no information on the performance of guns like these, so the data collected during the testing process will be both unique and valuable. The gunsmiths of the period must have been quite clever, working in workshops with only candlelight and primitive tools and virtually no machine tools whatsoever, uh, possibly a basic lathe uh, for boring out the barrel. The barrel is the last part of the gun to be fitted. The reason for its distinctive shape is still a mystery. On this particular musket, the barrel shape is unusual. I've no idea why it was constructed like that. It's a novel way. Uh, it was square in section, and the corners were taken off the square, and then the barrel was mounted with the corner fitting uppermost in the stock. An unusual configuration. I've never seen anything like that before, but it's quite effective. It gives a good sighting plane on the top of the barrel, and it's not too difficult to actually mount the stock into the woodwork because you put putting flats into the wood rather than rounds. It's interesting to think that they'd uh, an order of possibly something like 4,000 of these to make and uh, they must have got themselves well organized to do it but I feel that the barrels themselves would have initially all been hand forged and then bored and then the stock mounted to the stock by hand in exactly the same way that we're building this one. The tests proved why the guns at Pavia were so effective. The replica Henry VIII gun was extremely powerful, accurate and easy to shoot. <laughs> 
a shot with 50 grains of gunpowder pierced metal plate a sixteenth of an inch thick. And the shot with 65 grains punched through two of these plates, travelling at over 1300 miles per hour. 16th century gun technology was making rapid progress. A hundred years was a significant period of development in the weapons industry. There were tremendous leaps forward because we've now got a sophisticated lock where a hundred years back with a simple match which was held in the hand and just waited to touch into the pan and hope that the uh, handgun actually fired. The crude medieval handgun had developed into an efficient fighting weapon, easy to use, powerful and accurate. The Henry VIII matchlock was one of the most advanced guns of its day. Henry was only interested in procuring the very best weapons. But there still had to be a slow, deliberate loading procedure. Each stage had to be carefully completed before moving on to the next to load safely and avoid misfires. Like the medieval hand gunner with his crude weapon, the 16th century gunner was also handling gunpowder and a burning match cord, a dangerous combination. And these were real hazards for the gunners. Men were blinded and badly burnt through carelessly mishandling their weapons. When the gun was loaded and primed, there was one last awkward manoeuvre, carefully attaching the burning match cord to the lock. In the heat of battle, this was no easy task, but it was made possible and relatively safe by constant practice and the adoption of a precise drill. Cock your match. The sequence of actions required was split into a series of individual Guard instructions, always given in the same order. These Guard were regularly match. practiced, and by the 17th century were match. even published in drill books. Open your pan, present, Give fire! In this way, when loading and firing in the heat of battle, a soldier usually, though not always, got it right. Musket fire took a heavy toll on the battlefields of the English Civil Wars in the middle of the 17th century, but these matchlock guns did have some major disadvantages. There were three principal problems with the matchlock. Firstly, that you had a troop of soldiers carrying quantities of match which were already lit amongst quantities of gunpowder. That's not an ideal combination, clearly. There was always the danger of accidental explosion. In bad weather, the match clearly was a problem to keep going. If you were fighting in the rain, your match stood a good chance of being put out. The match was consumed in large quantities uh, simply by being burned away. If the sentry was on duty with his matchlock, clearly the match was burning all the time, uselessly largely. And probably one of the more uh, unusual expectations was that, of course, he at night would be on sentry duty and the small glowing match would give away his position. So, from the beginnings of the, even from the beginnings of the 16th century, gunmakers have been trying to come up with a system which meant that those disadvantages could be done away with. The answer was a very sophisticated weapon with a new ignition system that overcame many of the problems of the old matchlock musket. The first successful new mechanism that appeared about 1500 was the wheel lock. We don't know the originator, but certainly there are drawings showing simple mechanisms which we think were tinder lighters. They operated like a cigarette lighter. A serrated wheel revolves against iron pyrites, producing a spark. It was not a very great leap of technology to create one fire lighting device and attach it to the simple metal barrel that was, in effect, the medieval handgun. And we're fortunate here in the museum in having a very, very early example of a wheel lock. This almost certainly dates from about 1520 and shows very clearly how the mechanism worked. It's a metal plate which has attached to it a serrated steel wheel which spun on a, 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 an axle which has a square end on which you put a small key or spanner which is where we get the name from. The, the wheel turns perhaps only three quarters of a turn until it comes into engagement with a little device called a sear or trigger mechanism. And if I turn it, you can see that the top of the wheel appears in the bottom of a tiny priming pan where the priming powder would sit. And when the pistol was loaded, this pan cover would be able to sit over that priming powder and keep it in place. <laughs> 
and then the thyra would have a small piece of iron pyrites, a natural mineral, held in the jaws of this piece called the dog, and that will be lowered onto the top of the wheel. And all that happens when you pull the trigger is that the wheel is allowed to spin, and that strikes sparks in the pan amongst the priming powder, which connects with the vent in the barrel and fires the charge. This was practical, mechanically sound, and reliable. The new wheel lock technology produced an entirely new gun which was compact, light, and portable. The wheel lock really allowed the pistol to appear for the first time. And although it's in relative terms a primitive device, it was perfectly possible for the wearer to carry it until he needed to shoot it. It became possible for the first time to use guns successfully from horseback and this transformed the use of cavalry in the 17th century. The wheel lock did away with the matchlock's awkward and dangerous burning match cord. The wheel lock was precision engineering with a loading sequence that any gunner could master. But there were also problems. The mechanism was very expensive to manufacture. The spring that drove the wheel mechanism needed to be extremely powerful. We know that they broke down fairly often or that if you left it spanned that it would jam and so clearly there were some disadvantages and so when you're looking at the development of firearms you find that there's a very long period when the wheel lock and the match lock are in use simultaneously but by different forces and for different reasons. The wheel lock was neat and practical but complicated to make and difficult to maintain and repair. A simpler mechanism was needed. From the end of the 16th century, gun makers are starting to try and find an alternative, cheaper method, which is an improvement on the match lock, but which doesn't have the problems of cost that the wheel lock did. And a fairly early example of that, this dates from the middle years of the 17th century, is um, a flint lock. The flint lock is a term that covers a whole family of mechanisms, probably based on the domestic tinder lighter. A piece of flint is held in the jaws of the cock, and when the trigger is pulled, the cock is forced forward and the flint strikes a steel surface, creating hot metal sparks to ignite the powder in the pan below. A small touch hole communicated the fire to the powder in the barrel and set off the main charge. This early flintlock is a type we call a snap hands. It has a steel striking surface, or frizzen, separate from the cover to the pan. In the fully developed flintlock, the frizzen and the pan cover were combined. The result was a simple, efficient weapon that dominated the battlefield for nearly 200 years. It was still difficult to use in bad weather, it still took a relatively long time to load, but it was very effective when fired in volleys by infantry drawn up in lines. To fight effectively in line, a great deal of training was required. It was essential for infantrymen to maintain their formations even when marching, and consequently the movement of troops on the battlefield was slow and deliberate. Loading a musket in the heat of battle could be a nerve-wracking process, but the soldiers were drilled relentlessly until loading became a mechanical action. Every army had its own drill book, which was updated regularly. With training, the reloading process could be carried out efficiently under fire, even when hard pressed by the enemy. At least, that was the theory. In practice, discipline often broke down on the battlefield. And once all the muskets were fired, the battalion was highly vulnerable to a charge while attempting to reload. To avoid the situation where all soldiers fired at once and then all had to reload at the same time, systems of platoon firing like this were developed during the 18th century. Units of infantry were divided equally into platoons which loaded, fired and reloaded in strict order. The result was a continuous barrage of musket fire. The gun had come of age on the battlefield and was now a formidable weapon of war.
The flintlock was so much less expensive to manufacture than the wheel lock. It was much simpler, it had fewer springs, fewer components, none of which were under the kind of strain that the wheel lock components were. It was cheaper, more durable, and more affordable. And so once that technology, uh, overcoming the disadvantages perhaps of the match lock and the problems that the wheel lock posed, stayed in widespread use really for over 200 years after its first invention. To have a piece of technology in use from 1580 to 1850 is remarkable. But it was not just the military who saw the advantages of the flintlock. Flintlock pistols were commonly carried by civilians for self-protection. And the flintlock pistol also became the favorite personal weapon of officers and gentlemen, who eventually gave up the sword in favor of the pistol for settling disputes of honor. Both parties in a duel had plenty of time to reconsider their decision to fight during the careful loading of a pair of matching flintlock pistols by one of the seconds. Duels were sometimes fought for the most trivial of reasons. In this one, the two men had quarreled over a fight between their dogs. English gunsmiths specialized in making flintlock pistols for dueling. They were always made to the very highest standards, as they were purchased by wealthy and discerning buyers. Officers and gentlemen were expected to uphold their honor with sword or pistol. In 1803, this duel took place in London. Captain McNamara, the challenger, had already fought two or three duels. He was an excellent shot. Lieutenant Colonel Montgomery was also a capable shot. Both would have been confident in their own abilities and in the reliability of their pistols. These flintlock dueling pistols were reliable and accurate. The argument over the fighting dogs was settled with the death of Lieutenant Colonel Montgomery. Captain McNamara was wounded but survived. He was later tried for Montgomery's murder and acquitted. By the middle of the 19th century, the flintlock had been replaced in military service by guns that were fired not by powder in a pan, which was always a problem in wet weather, but by little copper caps containing a chemical, fulminate of mercury, that exploded when hit. Similar caps, set in the base of the cartridge, still set off the ammunition used by modern soldiers. The invention of the percussion cap, the perfection of rifling that makes firearms accurate at longer ranges, the development of smokeless powder, and one other crucial improvement has given us guns as we know them today. Over the centuries, handguns had become more reliable, more effective. They had come to dominate the battlefield and to be widely used by civilians too but they still had one major disadvantage. They only fired a single shot, or most did. In fact, this problem had been exercising the ingenuity of gun makers for centuries. From the earliest days of firearms, there's always been felt the need to fire more than one shot. The simplest way of achieving this was perhaps by loading a barrel with several shots and firing them in succession. This is a wheel lock from about 1550, it has three locks, the barrel is loaded three times with separate charges and balls, and then the locks are fired in succession. The great risk with any weapon of this type, using one charge after another, is that they're fired in the correct order. This is achieved on this particular weapon by having safety locks, which can lock each particular wheel lock and prevent it from being fired except when required. But if by mistake or in the heat of battle or whatever else, the wrong lock was fired in the wrong succession, the chances were that the gun would blow up in the user's face. This extraordinary gun was probably made as an object of curiosity. But designers tried for centuries to develop a successful repeating weapon. Colt's patented revolver, with a cylinder holding five or six shots, ushered in a new era of gun design and use.
From the middle of the 16th century, gunsmiths had attempted to design a practical revolver. Few had been successful. One interesting example is in the Royal Armourer's collection. One tends to think of the revolver as being a modern invention. And indeed, it's probably the most common handgun in use today. But this revolver dates back to the later years of the 17th century. It's a flintlock or a snap-on's revolver, but it embodies all the features that were to be found later on Colt's revolver of 1851. By cocking the hammer, the cylinder rotates to bring the next chamber into line for firing. It's self-priming, it contains its own charge of powder so that one doesn't have to reload after every shot. The problem with this was at the time, its concept was in advance of the technology to make it. And whilst this particular one was made, the machinery, the mechanisation, the engineering skills required to work to such close tolerances were not available. And so it had to wait until Colt came along in the 19th century to make the revolver a practical working pistol. In actual fact, Colt did see this pistol when he visited London in 1851. But by that time, his gun had been designed and perfected, so he cannot really have stolen the idea, only improved upon it. Colt's revolvers and the men who used them became legends and an endearing image in popular culture. But the invention of a practical repeating gun was 200 years away from the 17th century battlefield. During an attack, soldiers had no time or opportunity to reload their muskets as they pressed forward. So they did the next best thing as they closed on the enemy. They used their muskets as clubs. Musketeers could not always defend themselves and often had to rely upon the cold steel carried by pikemen. With a single shot musket, this was a real problem. The reloading process took too long in the heat of battle. How could a soldier armed with such a gun defend himself once it had been fired? The practical solution that emerged is still in use today. At the Royal Military College Sandhurst, officer cadets parade in full dress uniform with bayonets fixed. The bayonet evokes a powerful image of men fighting face to face with the cold steel. Today, it's more ceremonial than practical. But it's curious that the young soldiers fix their bayonets to modern automatic weapons capable of killing a man a mile away. It represents something extra on the battlefield. Like the sword, it can inspire confidence. Even in the age of the automatic rifle, the infantry soldier still carries the bayonet. Of course, it's come a long way from the 17th century plug bayonet. The big problem with that was that when it was jammed into the musket's muzzle, you couldn't fire. The socket bayonet of the early 18th century was a great improvement. It fitted round the weapon's muzzle so that you could load and fire while the bayonet was fixed. Towards the beginning of the 19th century, sword bayonets came in. And these were really first designed for rifle-armed troops who had an accurate weapon. And they didn't want to have their bayonet fixed until the last possible moment. So they were issued with a sword bayonet, which could actually be used as a sword, even when it wasn't fixed to the rifle. There is a vivid description of the bayonet in action in the late 19th century Zulu Wars, when the British fought African warriors armed with spears called assegai. A Royal Armouries interpreter recounts the fighting as remembered by a soldier who was there. Over and over they attacked, rushing madly up to the wall, and where they could, grabbing at the muzzles of our rifles or our bayonets and where they could, using these or their assegais to overcome the wall. But over and over they failed. From the rapid fire of our rifles and some healthy stabbing from our bayonets. In 1914, the British soldier went to war in Europe for the first time in 50 years with the bayonets. 
and in 1939, the British soldier returned to Europe with fixed bayonet against tanks and aircraft. Of course, there's a good deal more to the bayonet than simply a piece of steel on the end of a rifle. Fixing it fills a soldier with confidence and gives him that courage to go the last couple of hundred meters to get to grips with the enemy. For 300 years, the bayonet has played an important role in the development of the modern way of war. Across the battlefields of history, relatively few soldiers were actually killed by bayonets. Of course, there were times, like the Battle of Culloden, when there was actually a fierce hand-to-hand -hand fight. But usually, the sight of that piece of steel on the end of a rifle persuaded one side or the other to seek an urgent appointment elsewhere. They ran away rather than face the steel. But today, modern weapons, fast shooting and accurate, have distanced the enemy. Now it's generally the bullet, not the bayonet, that kills.